morning everyone so today is the 12th of may and the reason i'm telling you the date today is because today is a very special day uh anyone that has been watching these regularly the daily reads for year two, one and two will know that we are doing time traveling and the stories are related to people that uh significant people in history and today would be Florence Nightingale's 200th birthday so it's a, a to commemorate her birthday and we've already done Florence Nightingale so that's a bit of a conundrum on my part because we should have been doing Florence Nightingale today but as luck would have it I had chosen to do another nurse who isn't really very well remembered uh, she is a British nurse uh, so that's good because I was going to do another nurse today. She's called Mary Seacole and she did know Florence Nightingale. She is from that time. And also today it is uh, Na National Nurses Day today. So today on the 12th of May, we are celebrating um, UK Nurses Day. So what a good way to celebrate it than doing another story on another nurse. So today we are doing the life of Mary Seacole. Now, Mary Seacole was a British nurse. Um, now, she was a black nurse uh, in the Victorian time. So, Victorian era, obviously, women of um, black or ethnic race weren't treated very well. Well, in fact, people of eth ethnic race, no matter where they were, whether they were um, male or female, weren't treated very well anyway. So, but she wanted to be a nurse. So, this is her story. So... Mary Seacole was a, a war nurse. She was born in 1805 and she cared for the wounded and maimed during the Crimean War. The Crimean War um, is around the Ukraine, which is near Russia. Um, but her fame wasn't really well known because it was around the time of Florence Nightingale. She was Jamaican by birth, um, but she was very adventurous. This uh, was Mary Seacole. She operated several successful businesses in the Caribbean and Latin America, but she was best known for her being a herbal medical specialist. So that means she used herbs as medicine. Um, and she once wrote during her time, um, about her time in this Crimean war, that she, this is her actual quote, I do pray, I pray, do not pray to God that I may never see its like again, for I wish to be useful all of my life. She wrote, of the, and that was what she wrote in her autobiography. So this is her story about Mary Seacole. Mary Seacole was born Mary Jane Grant in Kingston, Jamaica in 1805. Her mother was Creole, or a person of mixed race. And Seacole's father was white and a native of Scotland. He was a Scottish short soldier. He was an officer in the British Army and probably stationed there as part of a military army whose duty it was to secure the island against the Spanish, from whom Britain had seized it originally back in 1655. At the time of Seacole's birth, Jamaica was emerging as the world's leading export of sugar. Mmm, yummy. Which was shipped out of the bustling port city of Kingston, to the rest of the British Empire and its assorted trading partners. As you can hear, my doggies like this story. Blacks were not native to Jamaica, but brought in by the British from Africa to serve as free labour on the sugar plantations. Just five years before she was born, the island's 300,000 slaves outnumbered the white population 10 to 1. Seacole belonged to a small number of free blacks and creoles on the island estimated at 10,000 or so. So a free black or Creole means that they weren't a slave. They, they weren't, um, it's called indentured, and that means that they are, don't belong to somebody. They are free people, they own their own businesses. Her mother ran a boarding house that catered to both military personnel and civilians who fell ill in the tropical climate. Yellow fever, a vicious disease that was prevalent in the Caribbean at the time, was a leading killer. And Seacole's mother probably learned the herbal remedies she used to treat that and other sicknesses through the slave women whose medical expertise had been passed on from their African ancestors. Seacole was eager to inherit the career, as she wrote in her 1857 best-selling autobiography. 
I saw so much of her, she wrote of her mother and of her patients, that the ambition to become a doctress took early root in my mind. In her autobiography, Seacole makes no mention of political events that shaped Jamaica, including numerous slave uprisings and the eventual, eventual abolition of slavery. That means the ending of slavery. Fiercely committed to the notion of the empire and proud to be a British sub subject, she had longed to visit London ever since her childhood. And finally, she made her first trip to London in 1821. As a single woman, though, she had to have a male to accompany her, and she wrote in her autobiography that her companion's skin was darker than hers, and they were sometimes taunted by children on the street, for blacks were still a rarity anywhere in Europe. She made another trip to London about a year later, this time bringing with her a large cache of West Indian spices. A cache means a big hoard, so she had a lot of them, and her own homemade jams to sell, and she stayed until around 1821. So that means she was here in London for about three years. In her autobiography, Seacole was vague about many details of her life and her exact whereabouts, and therefore how she may have earned a living at the times has been subject of thought and people try and make up how she made a living while she was here. She did visit, so this is where she travelled to, remember? she. So when she visited London that first time, she would have been, um, let me see, 21, 1821. So she would only have been 17, 16. When she first came, then 17, and she stayed for three years, so she was 20. And in that time, it says she travelled to the Bahamas, Haiti, and Cuba. So that's quite far. Um, and she'd have had to go on a ship. There wouldn't have been an aeroplane for her to go on. So that would have been a very long journey. Probably selling her jams and spices and helped her mother at the boarding house back in Kingston, Jamaica. In 1836, Seacole married Edwin Horatio Seacole, a man described in various sources as English, a merchant in Jamaica, and the godson of the famed British naval hero, Lord Nelson. Now, I was going to say, he has a very, very good name, because his name has Horatio in it, and Lord Nelson's name was Horatio. He was in poor health, however, and died eight years later. It was one of the series of tragic events that befell Seacole around this time. Her mother died, and in August of 1843, both her Kingston home and boarding house were destroyed in a fire that nearly killed her. She resurrected her mother's enterprise, called Blundell Hall, and returned it profitably, to profitability within a few years. That means that she fixed the house, Blundell Hall, and made, started making it make money. In 1850, Seacole joined her half-brother in Panama, who was receiving a steady influx of travellers on their way to the California gold rush. Ooh. On the Panamanian Isthmus, she had provisions, business that sold supplies to travellers, but continued to grow up a boarding house and serve clients as a doctress, a female herbal medicinist that were called at the time. So she's still selling herbal medicines. Her reputation grew after she treated many cholera victims during one outbreak with a remedy that involved giving the patient large amounts of water in which cinnamon had been boiled. Now, if you have ever had cinnamon in cakes, it's yummy. But if you've ever tried to drink cinnamon without it being in something like a Christmas drink, don't. It's not nice. Cholera has a, was a bacterial disease most commonly caused by drinking contaminated water and cinnamon's essential oil has antimicrobial properties but it's disgusting, it's not tasty. She also became particularly adept at treating victims of violence in the rough and tumble Spanish garrison towns where fights and knife wounds were common. In 1852 she had returned to Jamaica where she established a makeshift military hospital for British soldiers sickened by another yellow fever epidemic on the island. I just need a drink. Seacole returned to Panama and set up another clinic near a mining camp when she learned about Britain's involvement in a faraway conflict known as the Crimea War. The Crimea War took place 1853-56, to which we already know. 
and the need for nurses to tend to the wounded, she decided to volunteer her services. Most of the battles took part on the Crimea Peninsula, which we know is now the Ukraine. There, British troops had joined the French counterparts to help Turkey put push back the Russian forces for control of the area. And when reports reached England about how terribly soldiers were, suffered, were suffering, excuse me, a wealthy British woman who was already making her nursing career began a public awareness to recruit and train women. And we know who that woman was, don't we? Florence Nightingale. And her services during the Crimean War has made her the most famous woman in the world. And we know that. Now, Nightingale was already in Turkey at this time, which we know. And she was still there when Seacall arrived in London to offer her services out in the Crimea. The doctress was well known in the Caribbean world. She brought with her several letters of reference from British officers serving in Kingston, um, saying how good she was in her medical skills, compassion and selflessness. <laughs> But Nightingale's recruiter was the wife of a cabinet minister who informed her that all nursing positions had already been filled. Seacole writes, I read in her face the fact that there had been a vacancy. I should not have been chosen to fill it. And according to the Times of London, the report published on the centenary of the war in the same newspaper, she and her business partner, a man called Thomas Day, decided to go anyway and to use their own money to go and set up um, a camp. They arrived in Constantinople, in Turkey's main city, where Seiko found Florence Nightingale. She asked her again if she could help and was again turned away um, and was not allowed to join the army of nurses. Seiko and Thomas Day built their own establishment from salvage materials in the port city of Balaclava, and they called it the British Hotel. It served as a hospital and rest centre for officers, but they needed payment because they had to find money for their equipment. Seacole ventured out onto the battlefield where she could tend to the wounded, both there and back in Constantinople, which remember we now know is Istanbul. She encountered many British military personnel who knew her from her own stints in Jamaica, and they were pleased to see her. She was even commended in dispatches sent by the Times of London war correspondent, William Howard Russell, who wrote, and this is his quote, a more tender and skilful hand about a wound or broken limb could not be found amongst our best surgeons. He wrote, according to the newspaper's commemorative article a century later, I saw her at the fall of Sebastopol, that's a place, laden not with plunder, good old soul, but with wine, bandages and food for the wounded or prisoners. And it was the wine that earned Seacole a few notable enemies in her line of work. Chief among them was Florence Nightingale. Serving alcohol to troops was not allowed for the conventions of the day. And the idea that a woman of colour was providing it to soldiers prompted some moral outrage among the prim-minded Victorians. Nevertheless, Seacole was greatly beloved by the troops, especially one Christmas when she was found enough ingredients to make several plum puddings, the traditional English holiday dish for the soldiers and officers. And many wrote loving, lovingly of her care in letters back home, calling her auntie or mother Seacole. Now, after the war ended, Mary Seacole returned to London, where a business venture with Thomas Day seemed to have gone badly wrong. And she was found to have no money so a notice of her it's called being bankrupt we've got no money a notice of her hearing appeared in the times in 1856 and this meant that a lot of people felt sympathy for her from the officers and soldiers that she had looked after in the war this came to the attention of lord rokeby a division commander from the war who urged that a fund be set up to help her the magazine Punch joined in and printed a poem titled A Stir for Seacole and providing an address for donations, the efforts culminated in a grand military festival held in Seacole's honour at the Royal Surrey Gardens in 1857. The benefit was the work of Rokeby and Lord George Paget, 
who had also been impressed by Seacole's dedication to his troops. The four-day event featured a 1,000 performers and some 80,000 attendees, but its finances were mismanaged and Seacole received very little from it. But it did help publicise her book. In her memoir, written by a black woman, first published in Britain, it became a bestseller, but Seacole returned to Jamaica in 1859 feeling awful and sad that she didn't get to see um, Queen Victoria. Race, though, so her colour and her race did not seem to be a factor, for the Queen had been known to meet with and even assist subjects of the Empire who were of African or Asian heritage. Seacole's biographers think that Florence Nightingale, who was a friend of the monarch by now, in the years following her Crimean War fame, had spread rumours about Seacole and seemed to have known that Seacole had had a daughter whom she had taken to the Crimea. Um, returning to London around 1870 as a new conflict in the Fran Franco-Prussian War, Seacole contacted a member of parliament who was heading British Relief Services but was told that she wasn't needed. For a time she served as a, a masseuse, which is somebody who massages um, to Alexandra, the Princess of Wales. But on May the 14th, 1881, Seacole died at her home in Paddington in London. Her cause of death was listed as, as apoplexy, or we commonly know that now as a stroke. Her uniquely adventurous and service-orientated uh, orientated life was largely forgotten for decades, until her name advanced to the top of the list in 2004 for the greatest Black Britain. In January, January of 2005, a previously unknown portrait of Seacol was permanently installed at the National Portrait Gallery of Britain. And that is how the story of Mary Seacol became something that we now study. Because up until then, nobody really knew anything about her. So that is our story today, the life of Mary Seacol. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.